So we're here to talk to you, give you some overview on what the transition is going to look like for our new SFU mail program. Um, we're going to go through the dates, when it's happening, how you can prepare, uh, what kind of steps that you're going to look like, what it's going to look like actually when the transition happens, what support is available, training, things like that. Um, we'll treat this as a fairly informal session, so if you have questions as we go, please just go ahead and, and raise your hand and shout them out. Otherwise, I'm liable to talk for the rest of the day. <laughs> Um, so let's, let's do a quick check in. Does sure. everybody know we're putting in a new email system? Just want to make sure. Yeah. Oh, Lee. Lee. <laughs> you just found out. Cool. One week to go, Lee. <laughs> okay, great. great. All right. Let's get started. So I want to first step through what that transition is going to look like. Um, through weeks and weeks, we've eventually boiled down this transition into three core steps. So looking at step one, that is really the activation of your SFU mail account. That is going to happen on the 28th of, of uh, April, on Saturday. So for all SFU faculty and staff accounts to get created on that day. In addition to that, your folder structure that you currently have in SFU Connect is going to get replicated over into SFU mail. Step number two is the initial data migration. So that includes your calendar meetings, your contacts, your tasks, and then the last 30 days of your email messages. This is a really important thing to note. So it's only 30 days of your last messages that are going to immediately move across on day one of the 28th of April. Step three is that remaining mail data migration. And what that means is essentially anything previous to 30 days will continue to migrate as the days continue to tick on. And you might be wondering, how long is that going to take? Well, certainly that's going to vary depending on how large your email size is of your whole entire inbox in SFU Connect. I usually relate it to how long have you been at SFU. If you've been here for 20 years or 15 years, you're liable to have years and years of information that usually adds up and that takes time to transfer that information across. Yeah. Now, not to worry because you will still have access to your SFU Connect if you need to go in and get something or retrieve information that's previous to the 30 days. It's not gone or lost. Um, it's still available. Do you have a question? How long is the SFU Connect Great question. Um, it will remain available for people to log in and access up until March of 2019. So, so it's, it's quite a bit a of year. time yeah. to go in and, and access information. Anything that you can think of I missed there? Uh, well, oh, let's take a few questions. Yeah. And, yeah. Go ahead. The last 30 days will be in both, in yeah. mail and in collect? Yep. Yes, that's right. Yes. So, so yes. That means It doesn't go away. Um, what happens is in order, because the, the, the sheer magnitude of the, the transition that we're doing for all of our, our faculty and staff, the number of accounts takes time to move the content. And so in order to get you up and running on the first day, we needed to try and figure out what the best strategy is. Doing that is that first 30 days. So 30 days of your messages, will, regardless of where they're filtered in your folders, will be available in SFU mail. And it'll continue to migrate for the next week or two weeks, depending on your mailbox size. But it's still all accessible in SFU Connect. So you won't lose anything. Okay. Yeah. It's hard to say. Um, to give you a bit of an example, so we migrated IT services pilot group in January. Um, for my mailbox, I've only been here for two years. It wasn't very big. We only had one server for our email for IT services, and it took uh, roughly two weeks for me, for my content to get moved. For SFU faculty and staff, we have eight servers. And so we're hoping, because we've exasperated the number of resources, it's really going to help us expedite that transition of data. And I'm going to take an extreme example. We've had employees who have been here for 20 years. It took months. Uh, it depends on how much data you hoard as well. It depends on your role that requires you to use, because email is now getting used, or email systems are getting used for filing, for a lot more than just communication. They're becoming workflows as well, or they have become workflows in the past. So it depends how you use it. The time do differ, and we don't want to give anyone any timelines, because we've never done such a big migration before, where we're cutting over everybody. And we're going to talk about how, sorry, I'll get to you in a second. Um, we're going to talk about what you can do to help expedite that. What are the steps that you can take to maybe expedite the process of transferring and what content's going to get moved and what's not. Uh, we had something over there. Yes. 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 There's, a, there's a piece that. No, no, brand new server name changes. And uh, with the email, uh, Jennifer will talk about the aliases 
uh, which is more around your identity that you may want to think about before the cutover. Yeah. It'll going to my mailbox Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, it will continue to move throughout the time from when it starts. Um, what will end up happening is you'll get a notification email that will get deposited into your account when all of your data has been completely migrated. So from the time that you activate your account and you're using SFU Mail until the time you get that email message, data will be transferring all the time as it goes. Um, will messages be available? I have to find out on that. I don't know. I don't recall if mine were. I don't believe that they were available until the very end when everything was transferred and then it becomes available just to prevent um, bits of data not being fully moved across. So let me find out. I'll get back to you on that and find out the answer. So you're thinking 30 days will be there for sure? Yes. And then the rest of it, I may have to wait until the whole thing is done? Yeah. It, it is only two blocks, 30 and everything else. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. Um, and anything special about role accounts? Um, special in what regard, like in terms of what they would experience? Yeah. Or there wouldn't be any difference if you have a role account um, that has access to email, exactly the same premise. The same content, your calendar, your contacts, your tasks, your last 30 days will transfer across. Um, Role account or sponsored accounts, depending. It, it, and depending on how much content is in there, again, if it's very, very minimal, if they only have 30 days, then that's all you're going to need. It'll transfer right through right away. But again, you'll still get that notification message that will tell you everything's done. You can fully use SFU Mail and put SFU Connect to bed, essentially. And uh, building on that, in terms of role accounts, what we've observed, sometimes you come into a role the predecessor's name was on the role account or some of the access. Sometimes some things do break. And when I do say break in terms of access, so that would be the first thing that our team will be looking at when they troubleshoot when you're not able to access it. And we'll talk about the support models as well. And we've built, the, the projects team built a huge knowledge base as well that we will be talking about today. Okay. Any, yes. <laughs> so Right. So let me, um, let me, I'll answer your question as soon as I get to the next slide because you're kind of going where I'm going to go next. <laughs> um, so to answer your question, um, no. Once the transition starts on April the 28th, all new messages will be deposited into your SFU mail account. You'll get a final email message in your SFU Connect that will indicate to you this is your last message that you're going to receive in SFU Connect. Go to your new account and it'll give you a link. SFU mail, which is mail.sfu.ca, to access your new email messages. What will happen is you can click that link, it'll bring you to the new mail site, you'll log in, you'll access, you'll see your information, your 30 days, your calendar, your contacts, all that information that got migrated. Any new messages will only be deposited in SFU mail. No new email will be deposited in SFU Connect at that point. So Um, it depends. You, there's definitely ways to bridge until that data transition is completed. Is that kind of what you're saying? Like you'll be using two? Yes, absolutely. And this, I think this is the biggest challenge that we're experiencing moving to a completely different mail system and the amount of sheer amount of data that we have basically built up over the years of using Connect. There is no easy way to move that content across in a really fast manner that wouldn't inter interrupt operational use of your product, of your calendaring, your meeting agendas, all of those things that you use SFU mail for or SFU connect for. You're saying it could take months. It depends on the mailbox size. Yeah. So um, again, we, we are not we are not saying that we have the best answer for that. The only option we had to move terabytes of data was to take on the risk of multiple systems for a period of time. Mm -hmm. um, we are in a position, and I'm just gonna take a little bit of a moment with Zimbra, our current product. <coughs> that product has been sold three times to different companies. Every time it gets bought over, they cut down the functionality. It's gonna get shut down. 
It's just a matter of months. It's going to get shut down. So we are a little ahead of that in terms of managing the risk. The risk we do have to take on is the operational workload. And we do apologize for that because we've had to live with it for some time. Less for us because I've been here for almost three years, two and a half. Uh, mine t took less than a month. Um, but if you are concerned, you can start cleaning up your folders now as well. So we'll, we'll talk about those things as well. There are ways to set up two systems on your phone, on your devices as well. So we can provide you guidance and support around that as well. Yeah, it's yeah, you a different can. Account I've had it on my, I still have it on my phone. So we can help you there uh, because our team has done a lot of research in providing that support as well. So keeping in mind, your content is still accessible um, within us. If you connect while that transition is, is moving across, it takes a copy of it. It doesn't actually like move or cut or paste it. So you can still log in and access information if you need to. Um, there's definitely things, and, I, and I'll kind of go into this next, what you should do and what you shouldn't do while the transition is happening, just to prevent a negative user experience as you go. Yeah. So that's just um, no, sorry, the content copying across is from when the transition starts on April the 28th until all of your data is fully moved into SFU mail, and then you'll have full access to all of your information in all of your folders. So you won't really need to go back to SFU Connect unless something weird happens, you want to replicate a use case, or you just need to validate if, did I have something there or not? So it's keeping kind of around for that purpose, yeah. Yep. Great question. Um, so kind of building on what Sandy was just speaking about, with the current system that we have in place with SFU Connect, um, we're running into a number of situations where there is a vendor instability. Um, there's risk that they're not actually responding to breaks that are happening in the system or bugs or, or it's impacts that are ca causing people issue with using the system. So we've lost some faith in the, the actual vendor being supporting the product going forward. And what that product looks like in a future roadmap for what they want to keep doing to enhance the system itself is not being visible. And so we had to start looking at other products to go to something that's a little bit more mainstream, that's a little bit more corporate and enterprise level supported for the size of our organization and where we want to go with email product. Um, that project kicked off about a year and a half ago to do an investigation into what the university's requirements were, what, what did we need to look at for email, what type of use cases do we need to support, and then we started looking across the landscape to say, well, what products are out there that we can even look at that are going to be viable options for us to choose from? Um, from that point, Exchange was the, one of the final contenders, and it was a decision between doing something in the cloud with Microsoft or doing something on-premise. Um, that decision was made at the university level, not in IT, but rather across campus at our 1IS stewardship committee, which are people made up from our VPs and deans across administrative and academic units. So that decision was to do something on premise, installed here within our data center um, due to privacy regulations across BC. We didn't really look at the, the safety and the risk that we would be putting information in the cloud, especially with student data. It just wasn't a risk that we were willing to take from a university reputation perspective. Um, so that kind of, that gives you a little bit of, you know, why, why did we get to that state where we needed to look at a new email product and how did the decision making go about getting the email product that we actually have gone with? Does that answer your question a little bit? Other universities or organizations? We're the only university in Canada. No, wrong, actually, because no. uh, Langara is using um, Microsoft Exchange in the cloud. And so uh, I'm talking UBC. about Zimbra, sorry. Oh, sorry, Connect. the current, current product. The current yes. product, we're the only lost university to get off it. The uh, They are, we, we didn't, we didn't, the landscape between US and Canada is quite different, especially around the privacy laws. Okay. We can extend it there, but I think it's apple to oranges comparison. Their budgets, their landscape is very different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're the no, last sorry. Canadian university oh, getting sorry. off Zimbra. I want to. I want to We're the clarify. last <laughs> university getting off Zimbra in terms of exchange. It is worldwide the standard for email. Yeah. 
So UBC is using it. Um, University yeah. of Victoria, I think, is still on. Yeah. I don't know if they're I think on they're on exchange. Um, I, I there's believe. a number of institutions in BC. UBC for sure. Langara is using it. Um, actually, I think you Capilano is using it. Is. Most of these universities are also looking at, back to Jennifer's point, they are going to Office 365 cloud implementation. We've moved away from it primarily for privacy laws. So we're a little ahead or backwards, depends who you talk to. Um, we, we just didn't feel comfortable compromising our privacy and, and data. Okay. But it's the same product, yeah. Okay. Yes. So if I have to go and find a message that's over 30 days old during the transmission, yes. so I can connect, find the message, can I then send a message from connect? Yes. And yes. Then they're going to receive it in exchange. <coughs> they respond, that's going to be back in exchange. So Correct. From that point on, I Correct. Can Yes. Yeah, and what we also recommend, and I actually got that from one of the sessions I, uh, I was doing with, with a group like this, what people uh, were talking about is copying themselves in that message. Yeah. So you will also get a copy of that message in, in your exchange environment, and then you can build the thread off that. Um, some people, what they did was they felt the conversations were still in the flow, so they forwarded it to themselves just on the first day. So that's another little tip that we learned from um, our audience, actually. That was a good And I'll talk about tip. the things. Yeah. That's one of the best practices that I'm going to talk about here. So I'm going to. Yes. Right yes. Yeah. So let me go through the. I'm going to go try and get through some of these slides. These are really great questions. So I'm glad you guys are engaged in asking these things. Um, so we want to talk about how can you prepare. And this really goes around the length of time that that data transition is going to take. Obviously, is very, very heavily dependent on the size of, of your actual email inbox. So you have an opportunity to clean up old content you don't need anymore, system generated messages are just lingering, you can get rid of them. Um, verify what's in your trash and your junk. Those things are not coming across. So we've actually had people that were using trash as a file folder. Please don't do that because it will not migrate across. <laughs> so be warned of that. Um, your briefcase. So briefcase is a functionality that only SFU Connect has. Um, Microsoft Exchange or SFU Mail doesn't offer that functionality. However, we are recommending to anything you keep within briefcase, transfer into SFU Vault. So any of those files that you're storing in your email. Um, your MySFU tab, this is another product that was added onto SFU Connect that is not transferable into SFU Mail. Um, so this really just gave you a bit of a, a favorites page where you could access you know, your pension projections, the faculty and staff page. So we have that content on our SFU website. Go ahead in and bookmark that information so that you're not relying on it within your SFU Connect product. Yep. What about archive folders? Archive folders will still come across. Yep. Um, Outlook 2016, so this is very dependent on the type of product you're using currently today. If you're using the web client, then you can ignore that line item. If you aren't using the web client, you're using an actual client side installed application. Um, it is recommended to upgrade to a version of Outlook 2016, either for PC or Mac. If you're using something outside of those products, have a conversation with your local support to see what options are available in terms of supported products. You just went a slide ahead, that's all, sorry. Oh yeah, oh, sorry, thank you. <laughs> um, this is a really great one. So passwords over 15 years old in age, we do recommend take an opportunity to evaluate if you need to change it. You might still have a secure password that people don't know and that's totally fine, but just gives you an opportunity to say, should I change it before I move or is it okay at this date? And Anyone then, who hasn't changed it in 15 years here? Publicly admit it. You have a password that's a <laughs> It's a good idea to change it now. Yeah, so ba it's actually uh, yes or no. I've and and uh, the yes part is <coughs> we didn't have that many constraints on passwords 15 years ago. So we didn't have alphanumeric, special character, and the length and whatnot. So some things have changed. That's also a reason, and it's also a sync thing as well. So if it doesn't meet the minimum requirements, the system's going to say, well, you really can't log in, and it doesn't sync really well. So it's a good idea to change the passwords now. Two questions. Know, back you up <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, oh, up one in here. Sorry. I don't really want a standalone version of Outlook. Yep. If we go to mail.com, which is on GA, then that is Outlook, but you 
It is in the web, Outlook web app. Yeah, you yeah. don't have to use a client application exactly the same as us if you connect. You have a fully functional web-based email product that you can continue to use without needing any type of a desktop application. So you have two options. Um, I think to be completely honest, it's really user preference. Um, I like the Outlook web app because I can change the themes and make it pretty. <laughs> I like the user interface for the calendar for scheduling meetings. Um, I like Outlook, the product on my desktop because it's an offline client, so I don't have to have my browser open. Yeah. So it depends on what I'm doing and what environment I'm in. If I'm on a yeah. laptop, I'll probably go into the browser. If I'm on my desktop, I might just use Outlook. And I'll give you the other use case. I like the desktop app for lots of reasons. Um, I primarily use that as my uh, main device after my phone. And I'm from meetings to meetings, and I like those reminders pop up on the desktop. Um, I also like the additional functionality where I can create quick action items and, and create some things. So for example, if I wanted to, just quick example, if I wanted to share a message with my management team, I can just quickly hit a button. It will automatically send it to them and I don't have to even write a message. It will say, for your information, or please act on this right away. So there's some things that I can do. I've used Outlook for a lot. Uh, longer. So these are two use cases, very different needs. There's no right or wrong. It depends what works for you, what's your role as well. If you only use it for communication um, and you're comfortable with using web client for Zimra before, we highly recommend just go to the web client. Yeah. It will work. Yeah. No, um, we have, yeah, so, so, yeah. so Thunderbird is just another desktop client that can be configured to the mail server. Yeah. So it's up to you. So you can have a web access or you can have the desktop client. If you used an older version of Outlook client, I think that's what we're trying yes. to say. We should upgrade. Anything yeah. older than 2016 will end up breaking. So if you're using an older version, we, are, we, we will um, work with you to, if it's a managed device, if it's covered under the license, we'll help you upgrade it. Um, if not, then we can have a conversation what the options are. Okay. Um, and so this kind of goes back um, you know, to that validating the sender information that we were talking about, the role account. So this is another one. We have an opportunity to look at the SFU directory. What is that name? If it's changed hands over time, you may want to log in at this opportunity again. Validate what does that say, and if it's not correct, get that updated if, if need be. These aren't all mandatory. These are optional as applicable to the users or the use case that you're running into. So immediately after account, so it's April 28th, the transfer has happened, you have an account that's activated now in SFU Mail. At this point, these are the first things that we recommend that you do. So you have access to mail.sfu.ca. So you, like I said before, you're gonna get an email message in your SFU Connect. It's gonna tell you, hey, this is the last message you're gonna get. To get new email, go to mail.sfu.ca. It's gonna provide you a link in the email message that you can click on and it's gonna bring you right to the Outlook web app, mail.sfu.ca. You're gonna log in with your same credentials, your, your computing ID and you'll have access to all your new messages. And it's gonna give you a message that's gonna say, hey, welcome to SFU Mail, it's your new email. It's gonna give you a bit of information, hey, do you wanna set up your mobile device? This is when you can expect to have your transition. You're gonna get another message once everything's completed. So it'll give you some information so you're not wondering what's happening when you first log in, and you're gonna get that follow-up email once everything's been completed to signify that that entire data transition is completed. So the first thing that we recommend you do when you log in is to create your filters. And these are um, what are called rules or what you know as filters in SFU Connect um, that would include your forwarding. So if you have something where a message automatically goes into a folder because it's system generated, you wanna read it right now, you'll have to reset those up in SFU Mail. Um, your email signature will need to be recreated in SFU Mail. Your shares, any of your folder shares or calendar shares will need to be recreated in SFU Mail. And then again, you're gonna watch for that notification for the data migration that you'll get, uh, whether it's a couple days, a week, or a couple weeks after you've actually got your account activated into SFU Mail. And then subsequent, if applicable, you can get your configuration of your desktop application and the mobile device set up for the new SFU Mail system.
Thank you. Point. Um, also highlighting the web link at the bottom, that will give you all the information about the project, training sessions, support, FAQs, questions that you ask, sorry, I don't even know your name, questions around what are the feature sets in Outlook that didn't exist in Zebra, how is it different? All mm -hmm. that is available on that as well. So feel free to browse through it. And if you have any questions, just call Lee. I'm just kidding, call us, please. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Lee. <laughs> So uh, after activation, these are the, some of the things we were talking about, the things to avoid. So um, once that activation happens in SFU mail on the 28th of April, there's going to be that period of time where the data is transitioning from SFU Connect to SFU mail. And these are a couple of recommendations to make your user experience smooth and seamless as possible. Um, so avoid making changes to your folder structure. I made this mistake. Um, lesson learned. I decided, oh, I'm in a new email system. I'm going to redo my organization and my structure. Well, when all the data came across, it looked at my old structure. And so I had duplicate folders, naturally. So avoid making those structural changes until that data migration completes, and then do your spring cleanup. Or do it before that. Or do it before the transition if date happens. If you have happens. time this yes. week and next week, yep. do it now. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, don't make any changes to your appointments or meetings while that transition, or sorry, previously to the transition happening. No, wrong. Let me step back. <laughs> don't make any major changes to recurring meetings or appointments while that transition is happening if you can avoid it. It sometimes will create odd behaviors. Somebody may not get invited. You won't see the response that they've accepted. Um, it may act quirky. Naturally, as you go from one product to another, it's not a one-to-one -one mapping. And so some of the information that's in your SFU Connect and SFU Mail, it may not look the same. And so try to avoid making major changes while that transition of data is happening. Um, again, changes to your email messages, so moving them between folders, um, being having a read or unread flagging categories, any of those types of applications to an actual message, it may not transition correctly across in SFU Mail from SFU Connect. Again, the feature set is slightly different. Um, there isn't a connectivity of a category or uh, a flag that you had on one message in SFU Connect where you might have it in SFU Mail. Um, this is kind of one that Sandeep was just talking about with, in regards to messages that are sent from SFU Connect. So if you send a message from SFU Connect while the, your account has been activated in SFU Mail, that message in your sent item is not going to be in your sent item in SFU Mail. So Sandeep had said, put a BCC on yourself so that you get that message and you can drop it in. It will get brought across from your old sent messages that anything new that you send from SFU Connect it won't come across. And so the, the best practice that we apply is to add that BCC on the message to make sure you get it in your SFU mail account. It will eventually move across with the data migration, but you won't have it at that moment in time. Um, and then again, every one of these slides, you're going to see that sfu.ca slash new email. I definitely encourage you to go on. That's your self-service tool. Any updates, any changes, any new stuff we find out, whether it's an issue or a frequently asked question, that's our central point for getting that information updated and being it accessible to the entire community. So how do you get more information? So along with the sessions that we are doing now is reaching out to the community and still trying to make um, a little sense around where the support needs may be. There are these general information sessions. It looks like I'm losing my eyesight. I can't read from there. So uh, the past. past sessions, um, I believe they're still accessible, the recordings, yes. yep. March 13. So if you feel you've missed it, please go and have a look. Um, if you have any questions, there are new ones coming up as well. In terms of training, we're going to have continuous training as well. Uh, which is the next slide. So if you want to know more about the feature sets, uh, you want to know how the rules can, uh, need to be configured or how you can make it look pretty, all those things, uh, you can go through these um, training sessions, multiple options. You can go through in-person training sessions. They're available on all three campuses. There is live stream access available for these sessions as well. So if you have a job that you can't be away from your desk for too long, we highly recommend that you attend those sessions. Uh, there are upcoming dates and locations that can be found at that link. Um, again, that link is available on the main SFU new email system. That, that link will direct you to every resource, training, um, what to do, what not to do, FAQs, known errors, 
quick tips and tricks. And we're also going to have information on day one, kind of one pager that people need to have access to. We'll be sending those out as well and making them available online. Um, did I miss anything on one, this? One thing I will add. So um, there's a lot of training sessions happening right now up into the point of, of transition. So up until the 26th of April, roughly. Um, there will be more training sessions that will be coming out after the transition actually happens as well. So once you actually can get in and start using the product, you can get in registered for both, again, in-person or online training for both Outlook for PC and Mac, um, and as well as the Outlook web app, so the web version of our mail.sfu. Yeah, so, so that's a very good point that Jennifer makes. Um, our strategy is not to just replace the current system. Our strategy is to help the community make the best use of the new system as well. So the support will continue. It's just not a checkbox that we want to replace the system. We will have those training sessions and we'll talk about some resources that you can tap into if you want to get more support in the future as well. So moving on to the next one, which is support. Um, traditionally, what has happened with the Zimbra or the Connect product is most clients, and when I say clients, users, they've been using the web interface. And that's the majority of our client base. Uh, with the new model or the new system that we're implementing, we want to have a different support model as well. We're giving them, giving everyone access to having a desktop install client, Outlook, Thunderbird, whatever it may be. To provide that support, what we want to do is we want everyone to have access to a virtual service desk. What that looks like is there will be a number available, which is on the website. Pick up the phone, call that person, and we will walk you through the steps or we'll dispatch somebody either in your local unit, we'll connect with them. So we're working closely with Lee and other local IT folks to provide that support as well. Um, it will take some time for us to get to everybody. So Lee, you can't be in every place. You told me that the other day. I thought you could be every office. So we're gonna try and automate lots of things, but they could be that logistical piece that we have to figure out. So there'll be virtual support as well as uh, in-person support. In order to expand our current capacity, clearly our current capacity is not built, uh, it's not enough to support that. Rather than hire additional folks, what we've done is we've come up with a partnership agreement with an external vendor who is bringing on board three to five years of experience folks from service desk and desktop support background that will be available manning the phones as well as walking around helping our desktop teams and the local IT teams. So there are about 14 people coming. So there are three on each of the other campuses and there are about eight for our Burnaby campus that will be walking around and helping out. We're starting the training next week on that. Um, we also have what we call as ITS volunteers. So across the campuses, we're going to distribute the different locations into zones. Each of the zone will have a stand-up desk, like a pop-up. You can go up there and say, I want to have two email systems configured on my phone. Could you please help me? And they will do that for you. If they can't do it, they will find an expert to get it done for you. Either connect that person with you or have them dispatch to your office and figure out the details there. And these are IT folks. We've already done a call out for um, the IT group to make themselves available. Um, the leadership team has cleared out their calendar for the first, first week to make ourselves available as well. Um, we will also have, so this cutover happens on 28th of April. That's a Saturday. What happens on Saturday morning, you just, you've seen all this information and in a week I go, what, what did Jennifer say? <laughs> where, where am I supposed to go? We are going to have our service desk available. So pick up the phone, call them. Uh, we're figuring out the hours, but it looks like it's going to be 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. If you have any questions, even if that means simply we have to direct you to the website or walk you through the steps, we will do that. So that's Saturday and Sunday. And obviously for the weekdays, we're going to have a full support day. Um, we also, I think I've, I've said this before, we're working in partnership with the local IT folks, figuring out logistically where we need to be, when we need to be. We also have open communication channels. Jennifer's um, added local IT folks to our internal communication um, tool that we use, which is Slack. So they have access, so they can escalate quickly to us, directly to the exchange team. And we can also escalate to them via that. Um, 
And the last one, I think I've already talked about it, the pop-up desk for mobile setup as well. One thing that we highly recommend on Saturday morning is if you're not sure how to configure the device or you want to attempt it, just use OWA. Use the web version. That will get you started on the go right away without any questions. But if you still feel the need, you want to set it up and you're not sure, then call the service desk. At least you're not in a panic mode. I don't know if someone's calling me or sending me an important message on Saturday morning. Will I be missing it? Um, it's going to be on the website. So it's a general service desk number. Um, you just call the IT service desk number and we're going to have a separate prompt. Yes, so it is on the website. If it's not updated yet, we'll have it in the next couple of days. I think there's actually, a, there might be a link on that paper handout to the get help that will send you to, I think there is maybe. The contact points. Um, okay. To give you the, all the different contact points um, <clears throat> if you need help with anything to do with SFU mail. Yeah, we'll, um, we'll, we'll look at our communication as well. We, I wouldn't mind adding that in the email that we send out after the cutover as well. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll have a look at it, yeah. Mm -hmm. But certainly, we, we want to have virtual and in-person support, yes. It's a related question. Uh, there's a limit of size of the email, like in time in or out. Mm -hmm. So is there a difference between the two and the old system? Like I haven't seen anything in particular. Say, I want to say it's 50 <gasps> megs. I want to, um, let's verify that, because yeah, I haven't seen sure. anything yet. I think it was 20 before. Yeah, I don't want to quote on that. I we can find yeah, out. let's let's get you the answer from the expert. Yeah, kind of a the common the thing. What's the there hasn't been a change on the um, the default size that you get, and I think I think if I'm correct, it just keeps bumping you, saying, "Hey, you're getting close. I'm going to bump you. Hey, you're getting close. Yeah. I'm going to bump you." Um, I don't know that there's a max capacity size. Um, nothing from that perspective would have changed from SFU Connect to SFU Mail. Everything should be, from that perspective, uh, as is. As a comment, these limits are so low. Like, I could think of the limit that we use for that. Yeah. So yeah. This probably is a time to examine that. Good, good, good question. Yeah. It's so foolish, as you said. Yeah. Time to argue about what yeah, I think, I think once we go into the new system, it's time to rethink our policies yeah. as well. I totally agree. Good point. Yes. Is the um, attachment size a little bit going to change? Oh, maybe that's I'm going to have to validate as well. I do not recall those numbers, but let's get you those information as well. So attachment, mailbox size. Yeah, I got I think that. those are the two, right? Yeah, and there yeah. is a question about role accounts I'm going to find out. The role accounts. Okay. Yes. So we don't have the that's right. Yes. So basically what happened in Connect is the additional tab that you saw from my SFU was basically a link that we inserted to make it easy for people to navigate. Mm -hmm. It's really a different system that can be accessible through that link. And Jennifer talked about bookmarking that now. It's not going to go away if you book up, bookmark it now. Or if you don't, you go to the SFU website, you can still find it. Yeah. It's the faculty and staff page on uh, SFU.ca. That's essentially the material that's in there. They've just taken like um, the most common accessed information and they put it in the My SFU tab. Okay. Yeah. So I actually have been using Outlook since day one. I came mm -hmm. here last year. So I just been mapping everything from Outlook to Outlook So you have two options. Uh, first of all, when you say you've been using it, is your device managed? Would you even would you know that or not? Does somebody support your desktop? Oh, okay. Okay, so it, it is a managed device. No, it's not. So if it's if it was a managed device, so in our environment we have two types of devices. What we call as a managed is it's managed through our server. We do all the administration, we do security patches, it uses our OS, it uses applications. If you have that kind of device, we're going to remotely update your package. You won't even know. It's done. But if it's not a managed device, then somebody will have to manually come around and configure that for you unless you feel doing it comfortably by Forwarding, uh, by following the instructions. I just need to change yeah, and, and again, I want to be very cautious when I say if you feel comfortable because everyone doesn't feel comfortable doing that. 
absolutely go ahead. We're going to have that day one package include some of those instructions as well, which will help you configure it. What you could also do is not remove the old server, add a new account, so you have both in the same. Yeah. So you always saving email Yes, address. just rename that. So what I did, yeah. yeah. Okay. What I did was, um, so Zimbra connector is required to configure currently to the email account. When you add the new mail server, sometimes that connector breaks it, so your app will start crashing. Hence, someone will have to come and configure for you. So I want to put that little caution up there. But what I did was I configured both, and I called one of them, do not use email system. <laughs> so I don't send messages from that, and I forget, and I'm going back and forth. But it was just a little thing that helped me remember, and the other one, I named it to me email, worked just fine. Are the new servers active now? Can you see earlier? The servers are active. Your account is not on it. So 28th of April, you're a keener. Um, I like that, but you won't be able to use it till we switch your account over. That's the major, the first step that's gonna happen on the 28th of April is they actually need to create your account in SFU Mail, get that folder replication and move the content across. So that's the first thing that's gonna happen on that 28th. Yeah. Do you have to go? I'm, I'm sorry, that's I'm okay. loving this, but I do have another that's meeting fine. to go. I'll take a last question, then Jen. Yeah, can let's go ahead. So Yes, so that's exactly it. So Friday night, technically midnight, which technically at 12 o'clock, four or five seconds, um, it becomes Saturday. That's when the actual activation will start to happen on the accounts. Yeah, Thank so that's you. technically Saturday. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So is the data that's going to be transferred only going to start back when I started actually using Connect, or is the data going to be on the server when I have emails coming through? That's an interesting question. Um, so let me ask you something just to clarify. Your, if you log into SFU Connect today, what does the information look like? Using Connect on a routine basis. Okay. So if that's... Anything inside of your SFU Connect account, and I, I would like to maybe validate that to be sure, but my initial response is anything in your SFU Connect account will get moved across. I don't know what your Eudora account is, how it's connected, what information is in there. If it's not accessible through SFU Connect, my concern is it's not connected somehow. So I maybe would want to follow up and validate a couple of things because that might be a unique situation. Because um, I don't want to give you one answer or another and steer you down the wrong path. Okay. But yeah, maybe we can find out a little bit more. Well, I've copied all my Eudora stuff, so if I could get oh, it, okay. I can start Eudora and I can go and open my Grab it, okay. So okay. Just that way. Um, currently, we're seeing a lot of slowdowns. Is that because of the migration? Um, slowdowns on SFU Connect? SFU Connect. Um, that's a good question. Depending on when, <laughs> when it was that you've experienced it, there's been a number, it was today. Oh, interesting. Two seconds later, it connects to the Okay. The, I know that there have been having issues with Connect. Um, and, and it's not as a result of the transition because nothing is moving right now. There's no data in migration state. Um, IT services was the first pilot with a, a couple uh, local IT departments that moved in January. That All that data has been migrated well uh, quite a while ago. And so the only other accounts that got moved were some sponsored accounts and they were done, the entire lot of them was done within a week's time. So there's nothing moving and, and it, wouldn't have, it wouldn't have any impact on that. I think we're experiencing issues with Connect specifically. Yeah. Yes, yes you can. So essentially think of um, 
When you get activated in SFU mail, think of that as your new place to live. Um, keep operating. If you want to clean up old stuff or change old stuff, that's what I would recommend waiting until everything's been fully migrated. But you can continue to operate, book new meetings, send new messages, add new contacts, um, you take advantage of the new features that are in there. You can color code your meetings and appointments and things like that to make it easier to stand out which ones are which. Um, definitely use the features that are there as if it's you're fully over there. Yeah, good question. Yeah. The 30th, yeah. And it's really like from the Saturday when your account gets activated in SFU mail um, until, because really all of your calendar appointments will come across. There isn't, it's not a 30 day period for that. It's only 30 days of the email messages. All of your contacts, your calendar appointments, your tasks, all that comes across on that first day. So all of your stuff will be in there, um, and it might be a couple hours delay before everybody else is on maybe on the same page as you. So if you wait at least until Monday, then you should be safe. But to Lee's point, we have seen issues specifically on the recurring meetings um, with a number of different users that with re like location, resource, rooms, and things like that. Sometimes they just act a bit weird and people, it disappears from their calendar. And so I've seen that it's valuable sometimes to recreate them in, in an SF email. And it just, it, it's on a case by case. It doesn't seem to be a recurring issue. It's sort of on a one-off. Yeah, good question. Yeah. They may not know if they've responded or not and things like that. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah. Sorry, I know you've been trying to ask a question for a while. Yeah. Um, I'm looking at Lee. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, that's a really good question. Do you have a, do you want to maybe answer or? <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah, it's owned by SFU and has a support station to be able to install. Do you have like a local IT support? Okay. It, definitely, there's um, there there is software licensing available for Outlook um, that our local IT staff or IT services staff have access to. Um, and then, you know, building on Lee's point, the office, we do have a license agreement with Office 365 that allows you to download the actual Outlook 2016 or Word 2016 applications. Um, I just don't know, you were mentioning if it's a home um, license or, or if you can use it for work, because I know people have used it to, on their work machines. I just don't know if there's a parameter. I don't think there's a restriction. No. No, I don't think so either. Yeah, you have access. I would connect with your local IT person. They'll have access to, to install it. Now just keeping my, and this is kind of, you know, we're working with um, like our strategy um, with our local IT, IT services to conjoined is the first thing is let's get you to OWA first. And then if you want to move to a client machine, then let's look at that onboarding. Um, realizing the fact that we don't have a one-to-one -one support to, to person ratio, we can only really take it on as, first come first serve basis type of an approach to get people set up if they do want a client machine. 
um, where at very minimum the OWA client or Outlook web app is very similar. There's really, um, when I first transitioned, I think the first three things I needed to learn how to do was how do I look up an address, how do I book a meeting, and how do I check someone's availability? Those are the three critical things I want to know how to do because the responding, replying, those are all the same. They're no different. So it's just learning the interface and the different process that it uses. But otherwise, it, it keeps you running from the very beginning. Yeah, good question. Any other questions? Yeah. So logging in from home is going to look the same as as long as I'm using the WS? Yep, yep, it will. So similar to what you do right now with your SFE Connect, you can access it here on campus. You can access it at the airport or at home. You're accessing that same website address, so you'll see it exactly the same thing. Yes. Good. Yeah. Well, the John is already the junk. Yeah. Um, I think I think you can configure it uh -huh. at the client so level. Mail? Yes, they do have a junk mail um, folder and they have the trash folder the same. It just we're just not migrating them across. So the content we're just not bringing across because we would assume, I guess we assume that you're not using it as a folder structure, but but it will stay for the year in Solar. Yeah. Yep, so um, great question. Um, so there's definitely support available and you can configure your mobile device to use an app to download and send and receive email. Um, the caveat, unfortunately, because of privacy in British Columbia, the Microsoft app that they've put out, we don't have the ability to use because it's not compliant with our privacy agreement. So that is not available, it's restricted. You can try to download it and you can get on your device, but if you try to set up your SFU mail with it, it won't work. It won't send and receive, it just won't function. Um, if you use a, an iOS device, Mac mail, the email client that comes natively on an Apple device, completely works, easy to set up. Um, same thing with your Android device. If you use a, the native mail client, and I believe even Gmail um, is functional as well to use as a mobile application rather than a mobile browser view of your email messages. So those things both work. And we do have instructions on um, the website on how to configure those devices. Um, I believe, if I remember correctly, the Android device setup is right from Microsoft. So it actually brings you to a video page on Microsoft on how to set it up. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Great question. So depending on the type of device, is it um, an iOS device or an Android device or both? Android? Both. So iOS, um, the calendar functionality does work with the, ma the mail device that's on um, the iOS. And for Android, I've used Google Calendar um, on my device and it, it syncs, it grabs the data. Um, it's not, I've, I have seen a couple uh, anomalies with it where I will remove something from a meeting in my Google Calendar on my phone, but it doesn't remove it in my actual email on my SFU mail. Um, so it's not fully integrated or synced like the Microsoft client is. Um, I know that the project team is still working with the provincial government to try and get the PIA from them to get the approval to start using that application. Um, and once we do, then we can open that up. But right now, it's still connecting to data centers in the states, and it's just not the risk that we're willing to take with that information. It's yes, absolutely. Yeah, and it, um, it would go through, it would take our data, download it to your device, and send that information to the states and then back over. We can, we can control that, we can't control everything, unfortunately, but yes, it does. Um, and it's, it's not supported, we don't support that kind of functionality, um, but recognizing the fact that it's gonna happen and we might as well try to help out as much as we can with being able to use something mobile. Um, so there is functionality, it may not be ideal, um, but there are some steps available that you can take a look at and try out, see what works, what doesn't for your use case. Yeah, good question. Any other questions? Does anyone feel better about what they know or more petrified? <laughs> Has anyone attended any information or training sessions on the on SFE mail? 
one, two? Okay. So, I mean, depending on what your, your, your experience is, there really isn't that much of a hurdle that you're going to have to go over when you get transitioned across if you're going from SFU Connect and the web client over to OWA. Um, like I said, the, the, the three main things that I found was how do I find an address, how do I book a meeting, and how do I look for someone's availability. And I'm pretty sure you can figure that out if you're a fairly avid user. If you're not, we definitely have support available to help through those challenges and get more experience with the interface. Um, Yes, it will. So it will look in the directory. Um, that has probably been one of my number one frustrations being the pilot group because it only looks to the directory of users that are in SFU mail. And only IT services and local IT, some of the local IT staff are in there. So if I'm looking for someone outside of that group, I don't have access to their address right now. So I'm really happy when this transition happens so I can get access to everything. We won't have that problem. No, you won't have that problem because everything will be there at the same time. Students. students. Yeah, so students are happening. So I got the date up there, August 18th. Um, they're getting migrated across um, for their transition. I don't expect that theirs will take as long. I don't know how big their accounts are um, or how many of them they're going to get transferred over. So, yeah. But we can still find them in the old. Oh, yeah. Yep. Even though we connect. Yes, and that's what I was doing was going over and getting them. Yeah, exactly. No, I don't think grad students are either because I, I'm in grad school on my addresses and it doesn't show as a student or none of my classmates. Your, your uh, connect is uh, address for both the mail contact. So I couldn't find your default system contact. Right? Yeah. The one gotcha is with the autocomplete. So there's a student connect and go back to the autocomplete. Yeah, so it gets reset. It doesn't work in the email contact. Yeah, it has to rebuild its... Um, database of who have you contacted recently in the new product. I'm trying to find Chris's pod database. Yeah. So that's why I didn't work. Yeah. So if you're used to typing we in an automated right. email address, it won't work unless you go on both the email or look at the option in the address book. Yeah. So and it works in the two. It'll eventually it will learn all the emails and all the things that you're looking for. So yeah. Right. It rebuilds that list. Um, what do you mean, like, by bulk filtering? Oh, I see. Like, moving uh, all the stuff you set up from SFU Connect to SFU Mail. No, unfortunately not. It's oh, not a... It might be... I look at it as, like, um, it's a good opportunity to do some spring cleaning in your email um, and say, do I really even need these anymore? I don't even have any messages that are being processed. Oh, it's just a waste. Let's not even bring them across. And so you just bring the ones that are relevant. <laughs> How, how many fish did you catch with that button? <laughs> I don't believe the fishing button has come across. Do you know? I don't think it has. I think it's the junk. The flagging is junk has for sure. Um, but I don't believe the phishing has. You can still forward the message to abuse at sfu.ca and it will get flagged and it's not. And it definitely uh, feature a new enhancement. Um, the scope of the project right now is let's get everyone into the environment, get them comfortable, get them transitioned, feel a little bit better about this experience, and then we can start looking at what kind of enhancements do we want to uh, put into the system. But that's a, that's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. So for the folders, you said we should wait for the migration. Mm -hmm. So what if uh, I'm impatient and I create the same folders? What will happen? Um, so if you go in, so while once the account has been activated in SFU Mail and you go into your, your folder structure and you make some changes, what essentially will happen is once your data has fully migrated across, if you had a folder named Bob in SFU Connect and you renamed it to Jerry in your SFU Mail, you'll get a folder named Bob who will come across with any messages older than 30 days will get into that structure. And so you might need to move the folder, the contents of that folder into Jerry and delete Bob. 
So it won't, you won't lose out on anything. You're just going to see a duplication or that extra old structure folder will come in with the contents that was contained in your SFP Connect. Yeah. So it just act, it creates a little bit extra of administrative it, work. It will match the folders right away from day one? Yes, so the day one, there, yes, it will, so yeah, exactly, yeah. So it just does not have the message. Though. Correct. If you're planning folder changes, no, 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 yeah. If you're planning just... changes, you didn't then execute what you could have. Yeah, but I mean, if something happens and you forget and you do something, it's not gonna, you're not gonna lose anything, it's not gonna delete anything, it's just, you're just gonna see it an extra bit of administrative step that you'll have to clean up once it finishes that data transfer. Yeah, good question. No, so any adding something net new in SFU mail won't impact that because it didn't exist and connect to migrate across. That's right. Yep. So this is a great opportunity to clean up your inbox. Mm -hmm. You know, if you got tons of mail, you can just put a new one in now and just delete the whatever it is. You can have a new one in two weeks and a half weeks. Yep. Yep. So do it now and be more efficient at making sure you're doing everything. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Yes. Okay. Yep. Um, you can you can create a number of different categories that are color coded, um, both in your messages and in your calendar appointments. Um, so I've I've put all of my meetings in green for my leadership meetings, or my one on ones are in pink. So on the calendar, I know exactly where they are because they stand out. Or if I want to flag my messages certain categories of color, those they're definitely available in both the Outlook web app and in Outlook product line. Um, I don't know, I don't even know if I could, exp I, don't, I don't even know how to describe how badly it's mapped. Um, I'm just trying to think what it looks like. I don't even know if the flags appear um, when they move across. I'm just trying to think now. If you flagged something for a message um, called personal, let's say, um, and it moves across into SFU mail, I believe it just won't have a flag at all. Um, let me just double check. That's a, that's a good question. <coughs> I'm going to validate that though. I do want to follow up and let me add it to my list. Um, so right now, I just want to understand a bit. So right now, you're flagging messages and not putting them into a folder. Well, I put them into the archive folder, but they're not. OK. Are there, they've got a tag for the administrator version. OK. OK, let me double check. I don't believe that the tagging will come across because it's a brand new list of categories or tags, like the naming of what kinds of tags they are is brand new in SFU Mail versus in SFU Connect. Um, but let me ask, because I just want to be sure, I'm going to ask the functional team to see, because um, they've done all the t use case testing, to know what that looks like and what mapping options are available or if not. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, this is the first thing you can do with, as soon as it gets, um, your account gets activated on the 28th is go in and start creating those categories or tags in your, your new email system. I definitely will follow up because I do want to know the answer as well. Um, in case it gets asked again, I always like to have um, the information and then I can follow up with you if you want to give me your name and I can reach out to you after the session. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Any other questions? It's just email. <laughs> it's just, you say, it's funny because um, um, the the, si the sheer size of this project, the impact and the reach that it has is, is a, so huge and it's such a personal experience for people when they use email and so it's not just email messages anymore. It's my calendar, it's my agenda, it's my tasks, it's my folders, it's, it's my life. 
it's everything, right? You, everyone uses your email for different reasons, but it's you get so attached to it that it's a personal change that's going. People are going to go through, and so we've really ramped up our operational support and our transition support um, that Sandeep was talking about. It's those people that we're adding on and the, the all hands on deck that our IT services leadership team and staff are going to be doing for four weeks. It's not just the first couple days, it's for four weeks of time from the, the 30th of April to the 25th of May that we'll have um, increased support and people walking around and giving assistance and answering questions as needed just to make people feel a little bit more comfortable that there's other people that they can go to and ask questions and get help. Um, well, oh, so um, sorry. After like the first thirty days of the transition, we still have a we still have an email support team um, that is available. They have dedicated e support queues um, or ticketing queues that we can log tickets with and look at it. We have um, yeah, we have same same operational support will go back to that state. Um, we've got a dedicated um, SFU mail administrator that will be working on the technical background side, and then we have functional people on the front. Great question. Um, so mm, I'm going to get a little bit technical. And so if you don't understand, either ask me the question or just ignore me. Um, so Microsoft Exchange is actually one of the first products that we've built into the new data center architecture using VMware's NSX. And Microsoft Exchange, the application, supports high availability. Are you familiar with that? So high availability for anyone else is basically we have Microsoft Exchange or SFU Mail completely configured and running in Burnaby's data center. We have the exact same replication of the servers and configuration running in our Surrey data center. And so if something happens in Burnaby and it completely shuts down or the, the data center has a flood, everything will, no one will really notice that that happened because it's completely running in isolation in Surrey. So from that perspective, it's completely replicated across the two sites. Um, so we do have high availability, and the data is also backed up on all of our uh, VMs are always backed up from an image perspective on, I don't know the, the specific frequency for the backup plan for the servers, but I know for sure a minimum it's a daily image backup of the entire VM that gets stored, and then there's another offsite in Kamloops outside the earthquake zone. Um, I sure hope so. <laughs> um, I would I would expect yes because we do have um, we do have replicated backups of all of the database servers for Exchange, um, but I don't know that answer 100. percent So I can certainly ask um, or ask Steve or uh, Adrian or Exchange admin. They'll know what the backup schedule looks like specifically. I don't know, to be honest. I'm not really sure. It's not something that the two are connected. Yeah, and I think that Connect, we weren't running dual um, in two different sites. Like, yeah, we weren't running high availability. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and it, I think it really will depend on the actual system architecture. Um, if Microsoft Exchange running the data in a database and then the front end application side is different than how Zimbra was working, it might give them better flexibility of grabbing something from the database for a specific user. Um, but I mean, that's getting fairly technical and I, I don't want to put words in someone's mouth. So I definitely would follow up and ask that specific question because I'm not sure. Yeah. Any other questions, comments? We do have, um, I, I, I will give this presentation to Lee. If anyone wants a copy of this presentation, uh, let me know. I can certainly send it out. And um, the email address on the very last slide, whoop, email calendar feedback. Um, so if you have any questions while things are coming up, if you're not sure about something, you want to double check to make sure something's going to move across, um, that address might be in your handouts. I'd have to double check. Um, we have our, our project team and 
our functional and technical support that is available and responding to those inquiries as they come in. Um, so if you think of something after the session and you're, you wanted to get an answer, you can certainly feel free to send that in and someone will get back to you with a response. Um, I just want to see if there's anything on here. I don't see that there is. It will be on the get help for sure. Is there a get help? I don't see it on here. Oh, at the front. Uh, as a few new emails slash get help, they'll have the, the contact points on that uh, as well if you need to send in a message to anyone. Okay. There's no other questions. You guys are free to leave. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming in and having a great engaged session. I really appreciate all the questions. <laughs>